I am Kelsey Atwood, Tour and Public Program Manager, the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our virtual authors talk. The Society of the Cincinnati is the nation's oldest private patriotic organization. George Washington and the officers of the Continental Army founded the Society at the end of the Revolutionary War to perpetuate the memory and ideals of the American Revolution. The American Revolution Institute of the Society carries out their public mission to promote knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence by supporting advanced study, exhibitions and public programs, preservation and providing resources to classrooms. And our subject this evening is an excellent example that the lessons of the founding era can inform and teach modern Americans and lawmakers. Faced with diplomatic crises, um, domestic insurrections and constitutional challenges, and finding congressional help lacking, George Washington decided he needed a group of advisors. Washington modeled his new cabinet on the councils of war he had led as commander of the Continental Army. And tonight we are joined by Lindsay Trevinsky, who will discuss her book, The Cabinet, Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. And let me tell you a little bit about our speaker this evening. Dr. Lindsay Trevinsky is an expert on the cabinet, presidential history, and US government institutions. She is currently serving as scholar in residence at the Institute for Thomas Paine Studies at Iona College and senior fellow at the International Center for Jefferson Studies. Previously, she was historian at the White House Historical Association and a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. She received her Bachelor of Arts in History and Political Science from George Washington University and completed her master's and PhD from the University of California, Davis. She was also our 2015 Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati Fellow conducting research in our library. Her writing has been published by CNN.com, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, USA Today, The Hill, and more. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Trevinsky. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk with this group, especially um, one, because I'm so grateful for the support as I uh, did my research for this book, but also because the Society of Cincinnati features in the story and is a regular participant in the events, especially in the first half of the book. So it feels very fortuitous to be chatting with you about the roles of the Council of War and the cabinet. What I thought I would do is chat a little bit about how Washington created the cabinet and of course, how the councils of war played a pivotal role in that decision. And then I would like to leave some time at the end for questions. That's always my favorite part because I like to know what you want to know more about and be able to answer those questions and give that information. So I will be sure to leave time. Please feel free to enter your questions as I'm talking. It won't bother me at all. Or you can wait until the end if you want to hear what other people are interested in as well. So um, any conversation uh, about the cabinet really has to start with Washington's war experience. Like any human being, Washington was influenced by what he had done before. And I think too often we think of Washington as Washington the general and then Washington the president. And we really keep those two buckets very separate. But in reality, of course, he was one person. And his previous experiences, especially his leadership experiences, shaped who he was and who he would become as a president. So Washington convened councils of war before almost every major decision and every major strategic planning moment, whether that was choosing where to go for winter quarters, whether it was deciding on a battle plan, or if it was even just ordering a retreat. And these were really essential meetings of his officers and aides as a way to get advice, of course, but also to build consensus among the participants and to gain political cover for potentially controversial decisions. So when Washington was meeting with these councils, of course, we don't actually have photos. So these are, you know, some fanciful depictions of what may have happened, but we do know where he would have actually met. So Washington's first headquarters was at the Longfellow, well, what is now the Longfellow House in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
It still stands and I highly recommend a visit if you have the opportunity to do so. And this was where Washington um, hosted his headquarters for the first portion of the war when the army was stationed just outside of Boston. Some of the other places were equally sort of grand and fancy and offered lovely accommodations for the officers and for Washington and his staff, like the Morris Jumel Mansion outside of New York City. But the councils also met in Washington's campaign tent. And Washington's campaign tent was certainly large by tent standards for the day, but it was still a tent. And so that meant that there were bugs and dirt and dogs coming through and horses just outside, and it was probably fairly smelly. And we know in the summer it would have been quite hot and there would have been a lot of people in this space. So it would have been very cramped and very squished. One little fun fact, if anyone has the opportunity to go visit the tent, which is actually at the American uh, the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, definitely make sure you check out the entrance. They had to actually add additional fabric to raise the height of the entrance because the standard height was too short and Washington kept hitting his head when he was going into his tent. So they had to make a revision to the style to make sure it was taller. So that's just a fun little, I think, human element, which is really important to remember. Now, when Washington was bringing together his officers and aides, I'm sure some of you know, having studied these people, including your ancestors, that these were not small personalities. They were not wallflowers. They had big egos and ambitions and ideas about what should happen. They were accustomed to being listened to, and they usually thought they were right. So managing all of these personalities was not always the easiest task. And sometimes um, certain individuals were louder than others. My particular favorite example is Charles Lee, whose people skills weren't always top notch, but he really loved dogs and um, especially hounds. He had a pack of hounds that went with him everywhere. And I have one hound and I can attest to you how loud they are. So I cannot imagine what a pack would have been like when he brought them with him to the councils, which he did. So Washington was tasked with trying to figure out how to manage all of these people and other four-legged companions and trying to get the best out of his officers and aides. And he came up with a couple of strategies to try and manage these meetings. So first he would come up with a list of questions and he would send it out to the officers and aides ahead of time so that they could plan their responses and be prepared to give the best advice possible. Then he would use that list of questions as sort of a meeting agenda to try and keep everyone on topic and on track with their conversation. Finally, if the officers and aides disagreed about what was the best course of action, he would request written advice. And this was really essential because it allowed Washington to muddle over the facts, to sort of think through his options. He liked to ponder before making a final decision. It also allowed him to make sure he had heard all of the information and had all the data and facts in front of him. And finally, for morale purposes, it allowed him to make sure he had heard from every single person. And this was really important because if you remember when I'm talking about sort of this loud, cacophonous, sometimes very rowdy environment, not everyone necessarily wanted to participate and dive headfirst into the debate every single time. And so by getting these written opinions, he was making sure that he heard from each person and they knew that they had been heard. So it was a very important um, morale exercise. So how does this work in practice? The New York campaign is a great example of how Washington used councils of war for political reasons. The summer of 1776 went very badly for the Continental Army and Washington had to order a series of retreats across Long Island, across Manhattan, and finally into New Jersey. Of course, these were very unpopular decisions with Congress and the American people because New York City and the harbor were so valuable. So losing this territory, losing the harbor was a very emotional choice and Washington knew it would be very controversial. So before each retreat, which there were several, he would convene a council of war and make sure his officers were in agreement that that was the right course of action. Then he would send a report of that council discussion back to Congress. Now, they didn't ask for it. He sent it to them before they asked for it, but he wanted everyone to know that all of the officers had agreed that this was a really good idea, and it wasn't just his fault that they were ordering this retreat. Similarly, Washington convened councils of war when he needed to build some sort of consensus. 
And so deciding where to go for winter quarters was one of those items that required that consensus because they had to find a location that was close enough to the British army that they could kind of keep an eye on them and make sure the British army didn't go out foraging or didn't go out chasing Congress somewhere. But they also needed to be far enough away that they weren't going to be surprised by an attack by the enemy. And they needed to try and find a place that had enough food and supplies to support the army. So the selection of Valley Forge was one of those moments where Washington actually convened a series of councils to try and build some consensus around a location. Now, the winter, of course, at Valley Forge ended up being quite painful and the location ended up being difficult for reasons that they didn't totally anticipate. But in terms of distance to the, to the enemy, to the British army in Philadelphia, it was spot on. Now, finally, Washington, of course, called councils when he needed advice. One of Washington's greatest strengths as a leader, both as the commander in chief and also as president, was an understanding that he did not have all the answers. He was not always gonna be the smartest person in the room. He was not always gonna be the most skilled or expertise. And he needed to have people around him that could supplement that knowledge and experience. And he was not afraid to ask for it. So um, we all know the story of the Battle of Trenton when the American forces surprised the um, Hessian soldiers that were in, in Trenton and have this extraordinary moral victory. What comes after, I think, is actually a little bit more interesting. So Cornwallis marched down from Princeton and kind of surprised Washington because he made such a quick march and ended up pinning the American forces between the Delaware River and I think it's pronounced Assunpink, but I don't know. So we're going to call it Assunpink and someone can um, correct me in our conversation later if I'm stating that wrong. So basically the American forces were pinned there and Washington thought he had two options. He could either cross the Delaware River at night, um, but this time there wouldn't be an element of surprise because the British army knew that they were there and he wasn't particularly keen on trying to cross the river again with British sharpshooters taking aim at his soldiers. Or he could order a full frontal attack. Wasn't particularly keen on this option either because the positioning wasn't very good. It wasn't going to be a surprise and it was likely going to be um, take a lot of casualties to actually do this attack. So Washington convened a council of war on the night of January 2nd. He convened it in this little yellow house, which was actually the headquarters of one of his generals, General Arthur St. Clair. It was, a, as you can see, a pretty small building and there were a lot of people there. So they actually had to clear out all of the furniture from the biggest room so that the maximum number of people could stand in this space. Washington had his officers, they had some aides, but they also had some local farmers whose land was nearby and they brought them in to try and provide some local assistance, some local insight. And that worked out really well because General Arthur St. Clair was actually in charge of the far right flank of the line. And he said that some of his soldiers had been patrolling and found this little path that wasn't on the map. And Washington was able to turn to the local farmers and say, you know, does this path actually exist? Is it on any maps? Will it be found by the British? Is this an escape route? And the farmers said yes, and they offered to actually guide the army through their farmland on this path all the way to Princeton. And that's what Washington decided to do. He left a couple of forces. I don't know if anyone has seen the show Turn, but this is captured in season one. He left some of the forces there as a disguise, and the rest snuck along this path and went by the British forces and up to Princeton, and it was another huge moral victory. But if Washington had gone into that council saying, I have all the answers, this is what we're gonna do, and then looked for evidence to confirm it, he would have never found that third option. And so this council is a great um, example of how Washington was actually cultivating advice and input from people, including just local farmers, that he had no reason necessarily based on social hierarchy to um, respect and seek out as, as his counselors, and yet he did anyway. So fast forward a couple of years to the presidency and we get to the Constitutional Convention in 1787. Washington was of course the president of the convention and is featured as the tallest person in the painting. And the delegates at the Constitutional Convention explicitly rejected a proposal for a cabinet. They really distrusted the British version. They felt like it obscured responsibility and transparency at the highest levels of government. 
and would foster corruption and other things that they were hoping to avoid in this new government that they were creating. And Washington was there. He heard them explicitly reject these proposals. But they were reasonable men, and they put a couple of options into the Constitution, recognizing that no person can govern or lead by themselves, and they need advice. And so they put in two options for the president to obtain counsel from some safe advisors. So the first option um, is in Article 2, and it says that the Senate will advise and consent on treaties and foreign appointments. Now, in the 21st century, we tend to think of that as either a rubber stamp or a veto of a policy or an appointment that the president makes independent of the Senate. But in 1787 and in 1789, when Washington first took office, they took that advised part quite literally. And the reason they did so is the Senate was only actually 22 people in the fall of 1789. The senators were um, indirectly elected by the state legislatures. So the delegates expected that the states would pick respectable, knowledgeable, experienced, qualified men that would provide good advice to the president and would remove those men if they provided bad advice. So these were safe advisors. So Washington initially intended to comply he actually arranged his first visit to the Senate in August of 1789. He had to send some peace commissioners to an upcoming meeting with representatives from North Carolina, South Carolina, and the Creek and Cherokee nations. And so he wanted to craft instructions for what the peace commissioners should do, and he wanted the Senate's input. Unfortunately, when he arrived, he had a, an address that he gave to them, and then he had a series of questions, not unlike his Council of War questions. And he was hoping that the senators would debate and provide advice and different options for him to consider. Instead, they were silent. No one said anything. Some sort of shuffled papers and twiddled their thumbs and many avoided eye contact. And finally, after several minutes of what must have been super awkward silence, Senator William McClay stood up and said, you know, can we refer this issue to the committee? We would like to discuss it privately and can you come back next week for our recommendation? Well, Washington absolutely lost it. He stood up and he yelled, this defeats every purpose of my being here, except you have to imagine someone much taller, much larger, much louder and much scarier because this was the most famous man in the world and he was yelling at you. So he eventually calmed down and he did agree to come back the following week. But on his way out, he reportedly said that he would never again return to the Senate for advice. Now, the evidence on whether or not he actually said that is a little bit shaky, but we know that he was thinking it because he never again returned for advice. So just a couple of months into his presidency, Washington has already decided that one of the two options that's outlined in the Constitution for advice and support is inefficient and cumbersome and not really up to the task of providing the support that diplomacy required. So he turned to the second option, also in Article 2, and it says that the president may request written advice from the department secretaries. Now, this clause is crafted incredibly carefully. First of all, the president may require advice. He's not obligated to do so, and he's not obligated to listen. Second, the advice is supposed to be in writing. And that's really important because the delegates had been super concerned about transparency. And they felt if they required the advice to be in writing, then there would be a paper trail of evidence about who said what and who advocated which policy so that the American people and Congress could hold the president and his advisors responsible when they made bad choices and they knew who to basically blame for those bad choices. So Washington initially said, great, I will use written advice, and he started requesting um, reports and data back from his department secretaries. But even today, when we're texting or emailing, sometimes you know things get lost in translation, or the tone isn't properly conveyed, or maybe we'll forget to say something, and there will be a follow-up question, and then all of a sudden you'll have an email chain that's a mile long. So now try to imagine that you're doing that with parchment and quill, and you have to write it out, you have to wait for it to dry, then you have to wait for it to be delivered. Then you have to wait for the other person to go through the exact same process. And then what happens if you have follow-up questions? So again, this process was incredibly inefficient. It was incredibly cumbersome and Washington was getting frustrated. So what he started to do is he would send a letter 
the secretary would send a letter back and then they would come the next morning for an in-person one-on-one meeting to discuss any edits or revisions to correspondence or policy. So unfortunately, the president's house in Philadelphia where Washington spent the majority of his presidency no longer exists. So I've created a 3D version of what it would have looked like at the time. And it was one of the largest private residences in the city. And you can see when you look at it from the side, how it was sort of added on to over time. But on the second floor, there was a small room that was about 15 by 21 feet. And that was Washington's private study. Now, this picture doesn't do a great job showing just how actually stuffed full of furniture the room would have been, especially by 21st century standards. So Washington's big desk in the corner was over five feet wide. He had three mahogany bookcases, a dressing table, a globe, a, um, an iron stove in the other corner. And then when the secretaries came, he would have brought in temporary seating and a table so that they would have some place to sit or write on. So this was Washington's private space where he did all of his correspondence, where he had his daily shave, where his enslaved manservant did his hair, and it was also where he met with the secretaries when they came for those one-on-one -on -one consultations. And that worked for about two and a half years. And I emphasize that amount of time because it's so easy for us to think that just because a cabinet eventually happened, it was there from day one. And in fact, most historians actually fall into that same trap. But really, Washington did not convene a cabinet meeting until November 26, 1791, two and a half years into his presidency. And just in case you don't know who some of these faces are, from left to right, there's, of course, President George Washington, Secretary of War Henry Knox, Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, and Attorney General Edmund Randolph. So Washington has a cabinet. Great. What is he supposed to do with it? Uh, there it had been no previous cabinet. There was no model for him to follow. The British cabinet was certainly not a model because Americans were very, very distrusting of it as an institution. And so Washington fell back on his council of war experience. And he used cabinet meetings for much of the same purposes, for political cover, to build consensus, and of course, to get advice. And he used them from many of the same strategies. So he would come up with a list of questions, send those questions out as the meeting agenda, and then if the secretaries disagreed, which frankly became more often than not, he would ask for written opinions. So a great example of Washington um, using the cabinet for political cover occurred in 1796. Washington had sent John Jay, who was the chief justice, to negotiate a new treaty with Great Britain. And he sent that back in 1795. The Senate ratified it and Washington signed it. And then it was turned over to the House of Representatives to raise some funds for one of the commissions required in the treaty. But most of the Jeffersonian Republicans in the House really hated the treaty and they were looking for any opportunity to scuttle it. And so they requested all executive papers pertaining to the mission in the hopes of embarrassing the Washington administration and undermining support for the treaty. And Washington met with his cabinet and decided what he was supposed to do in regards to this response and ultimately asserted executive privilege for the first time. But before taking that contra some potentially controversial and very, very big first step, he met with the cabinet and obtained written support that they all agreed that it was the right thing to do, just in case he needed any sort of political cover. Washington also used the cabinet to build consensus. In 1793, France declared war on Great Britain and it quickly spiraled into an international conflict, which the United States had to work very hard to stay out of because it was not equipped financially, environmentally, economically, um, emotionally for a war, not to mention it didn't have an army or navy to fight with anyway, even if it had wanted to. Um, but that was very complicated because the gentleman at the center, citizen Edmund Charles Genet, who was the French minister to the United States, had his own ideas about what the United States should be doing. And he basically disregarded all of Washington's proclamations of neutrality. So the cabinet met a high water mark point in 1793 of 51 times, up to five times per week, sometimes several hours per day, to decide eventually to recall Genet from France. And to, they came up with a series of rules of neutrality that actually Congress eventually codified into legislation. But it took them several, several months of negotiations and discussions and contemplation of what to do and how to handle the situation 
And so the cabinet really was a way for Washington to build consensus. Now, finally, Washington genuinely needed advice sometimes. Um, in 1791, Congress passed a whiskey excise tax. And by 1792, it was pretty unpopular in the Western portions of Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Virginia, and North Carolina. Kentucky just pretended like it didn't exist whatsoever. No one, <laughs> no one paid the tax. No one enforced the tax. Lawyers pretended like there was none of this disruption happening. Uh, it was actually pretty quite hilarious from the historical records. Pennsylvania was a little bit more problematic. By the early summer of 1794, the protests had turned violent and they had actually burned down the house of one of the local tax collectors. And so Washington had to decide what to do. He could either leave it to the states to handle, he could convene an emergency session of Congress to try and call up the army. He could wait for Congress to come back into session in the fall and deal with it then because Congress was out of session. Or he could use a recently passed bill that said that the president could call up local militias in the event of domestic insurrections if the Supreme Court approved of the evidence. And Washington met with his cabinet and the cabinet almost immediately decided to pursue this option, which sounds kind of obvious with the benefit of hindsight, but really what the cabinet was deciding to do was to completely sideline the state governments and Congress on a domestic issue, which is a remarkable turn of events. And um, the cabinet advised Washington to do this and it actually ended up working out okay. He called out the militias it ended up being a fairly popular action, but the cabinet was instrumental in helping Washington carve out a sphere of influence for the president over domestic affairs, which was not articulated in the constitution. So it was a huge precedent setting moment. Now, of course, the cabinet has expanded and institutionalized a great deal in the last 230 years. We have a national security council, which did not exist in 1789. And the cabinet um, has many more positions and the federal government is much larger. But there are some precedents that Washington created that are really essential even to our modern day. So first, the cabinet is a very flexible institution. In his later years, Washington actually decided to convene far fewer meetings because most of his initial secretaries had retired or resigned. And what I affectionately call the B team wasn't quite up to snuff. And Washington often wrote in his letters that he just didn't like them quite as much as his original appointees. But what that meant was that the cabinet did not have a right to be in the room where the decisions are made. They can be invited when the president wants their input, but they don't get to demand to be there. And so each president has the opportunity to create and craft the relationships that are most beneficial to him and hopefully someday her. And so that's going to look different for every single administration. Washington also established that the cabinet is an amazing opportunity for coalition building and for representation. Now, when I show this picture, you might not think, well, that's not a very, you know, that's not a particularly diverse bunch. You're right, there are five white guys. And, but at the time, white men were the only people that counted as citizens in the United States. So it was a fairly small pool of applicants. But the idea that they were uh, representative of the different regions, economic, factional, social interest groups, uh, education backgrounds, religions, these were ideas that their contemporaries understood. And it was a way for Washington to try and build emotional ties between the states and between the states and the federal government at a time when those emotional ties were very tenuous. And most presidents since Washington have recognized that the cabinet provides that opportunity and have sought out diverse perspectives because it will make them a better leader, but also a diverse cabinet because it will best represent the nation and help the nation feel seen and heard in the administration. So in a lot of ways, the cabinet, while it looks very different, is still very much Washington's creation. Now, finally, I'd like to end with a little uh, fun history story that sort of represents that history has a sense of humor and also a sense of fate. Um, so as I mentioned, I have a hound. I adopted him when he was a puppy and I did one of those DNA test swabby things and discovered that he was an American foxhound. And I was doing some research about, about the breed and I learned that George Washington actually created the American foxhound breed. He bred French hounds that he had received as a gift from the Marquis de Lafayette. 
um, uh, and you know, an American um, Continental Army officer and a French son of the, of the Cincinnati. Um, he bred those hounds with English hounds that he already had to create this new breed. So when I realized that I wasn't gonna be able to sign books for people in person, I thought what better way to represent both my love of hounds, but also Washington's love of hounds than to create book plates with little hounds on them. So you can see in the picture, they're there. They're these little stickers. They have the hound. Um, and if you go to that link, you can actually put your name and your address and I'll send you a signed personalized book plate. And as I started doing these talks and, and meeting with our, you know, virtually meeting with readers, someone said to me, you know, Lindsay, do you know how the hounds got from France to the United States? And I said, no, I guess I don't. I mean, I know they were a gift of Lafayette, but I don't know how they got there. And they said, John Quincy Adams brought them over as a gift from the Marquis de Lafayette to Washington. Well, my dog's name is John Quincy Dog Adams, Quincy for short. So it was meant to be all the way around without me even knowing it. So history has a sense of humor and um, a sense of fate to it. But uh, these book plates are a way, my way of saying thank you for you know, being interested in this history. Thank you for being interested in the book. And um, hopefully at some point I get to meet all the readers in person. But until then, the book plates are my way of saying thank you. So. With that being said, I am excited to hear your questions and hear more what you want to learn about. Great, thank you so much, Lindsay. Amazing history um, and so wonderful to hear all about Washington and the origins of his cabinet. Um, I'll begin with a question that was submitted to me by email. Um, and uh, the question was kind of referencing um, a different era of American history, asking if Washington also had a kitchen cabinet in addition to yeah. his kind of more formal cabinet. And so wondering if you could speak on that. Sure, that's a great question. So um, in some ways, Washington's cabinet was kind of his kitchen cabinet because there wasn't supposed to be this institution and he kind of created it on his own, but there were people that he did consult with that didn't have official positions in the department. So John Jay, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, was a regular advisor. In fact, there's some evidence that he never left Philadelphia without talking to Washington first. So he was a regular advisor to Washington, but also to the other department secretaries at Washington's suggestion. So he was very close with Hamilton and Knox as well. And then once Hamilton actually left, the administration, he continued to be a close personal advisor and Washington frequently sought out his input on a lot of things, especially if they were particularly controversial, then he always wanted to know what they had to say. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question comes from David Sachar. Um, George Washington's closest advisor and right-hand helper during his presidency was arguably James Madison. Yet Madison, having, uh, despite having coined the term, was never a, a member of Washington's cabinet. Um, do you think Madison would have occupied a position similar to chief of staff or White House counsel if he was working in the present day? Um, he may have in the first year. So he, you're right, he was Washington's closest advisor for the first year that he was in office. But then after that, they started to have real differences of opinions about policy and that really drove a wedge in their relationship. Um, and, and that was also partly because for the first at least several months of the presidency, Washington didn't have secretaries in office. So he was relying on Madison. But once he had secretaries in office and once they shared real political differences, then Madison wouldn't have played that role quite as much. But he certainly, I think actually perhaps the most interesting parallel would be sort of like an unofficial prime minister because he spoke for Washington's interests in Congress in an unofficial sort of way. Great, thank you. Um, next question comes from Craig Howell. Um, councils of war generally have a bad reputation among military historians. Um, it is proverbial, for example, that councils of war do not fight was Washington's counsel an exception to this rule? How are they perceived? 
Um, that is a great question. So they certainly had that sort of bad rap early on. Um, at one point, Congress actually assured Washington that he didn't have to listen to the councils. He was supposed to make his own his own choices and his own um, make up his own mind about what uh, the army should be doing at any given point with their policies. Um, so they definitely did sort of have a bad rap. And you know, not every officer was created the same. Some gave bad advice. You know, at so at one point when they were, for example, outside of Philadelphia, there were some officers who were really pushing Washington to attack the British army in that was ensconced in Philadelphia. That would have been a very bad choice. Thankfully, enough officers were saying, no, don't do that. That, you know, that would be deadly. Um, and Washington, of course, listened to those ideas, even if he was tempted. Um, so I think that they were, like most big councils, they were a mixed bag. And some, Washington had had a pretty good sense of who he should be listening to within those councils. Great. Our next question comes from Scott Neal. What was the most influential source for your book? Um, so I, this book would have taken three times as long, if not longer than that, without the presidential papers projects. So there's the papers of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, um, James Madison. There's also papers of uh, Benjamin Franklin and they've recently put up John Jay as well. And those papers were instrumental in understanding who they were as men and understanding their terms of service, either in the war or in the presidency. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, they bring them all into one place and that is a very helpful service. They also transcribe them and they put them up online. So I moved around a lot while I was finishing my dissertation and then rewriting my book a bunch of times. And I didn't always have access to the same archives but I always had access to the website. And so that was really a gift. And so any, any historian who has used these, these paper projects thanks the editors so much because they are, they are a tremendous resource. And I should say they're something that is supported and, and published by the National Endowment of the Humanities. And so the federal government does support them and underwrite them. And they are such an important gift to making sure our history is preserved and told to future generations. Wonderful. Um, so our next question comes from Catherine Mattingly. Um, when you say his cabinet or George Washington's cabinet was diverse in terms of political philosophy, um, would you tell us how the original cabin functioned in terms of these differences? That is a great question. So um, Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton in particular sort of represented the diverse uh, the, the extreme ends of the two different positions that were in Congress, but also in Washington's cabinet. And they did so in a couple of ways. First, their life stories <laughs> were about as different as you could get if you were white men. Thomas Jefferson was born into this incredibly wealthy sort of aristocratic family and knew from the very beginning he was going to be a leading person in society. And uh, he served most of his time either in Congress or at, in a diplomatic position. Whereas Hamilton came from a very poor, poor family, born in the Caribbean, sort of had to make his own way with the help of a couple of very important investors who invested in his, um, in his future, really sort of hard luck, scrabble, tough, uh, made his way into the army, had a very militaristic and martial presentation of masculinity. And that was very different than Thomas Jefferson's. But then they also had diametrically opposed worldviews. So pretty, on pretty much every issue, whether it was which country the United States should ally itself with, what, where the federal government should invest its resources, who was the ideal citizen, where should Americans be living, you name it, they disagreed on those subjects. And um, it got to the point where they were convinced that the other person was a mortal threat to the future of the Republic. And that sounds, you know, maybe kind of hyperbolic to us today, but they were genuinely convinced that one wrong step and the country would completely fall apart. And that played out in cabinet discussions when they were trying to figure out what to do and they were presenting these different views. And, um, you know, we tend to think that Hamilton really won out but that is a byproduct of Jefferson living so much longer than Hamilton and Washington and leaving a written record to shape our thinking. In reality, Washington actually basically went back and forth 
and often sided with Jefferson and then often sided with Hamilton and really tried to balance between the two. Great. Um, our next question comes from Cliff Lewis and he asks, how did the Senate take being sidelined by the cabinet? And then also, how did the American public view the existence of the cabinet? These are excellent questions. So one of the things that surprised me the most was that I didn't see more of a backlash against the cabinet, given how strongly Americans felt about the British cabinet and how much they distrusted the British cabinet and how much they blamed the British cabinet for instigating the hostilities that led to the revolution. So what I found was Americans accepted that Washington either needed advice or they accepted it because Washington created it. But if specific individuals governed in a way that looked too much like the British cabinet, then they pushed back on those individuals. So Hamilton received a lot of criticism and people compared him to Robert Walpole or Lord North, who were two particularly hated British ministers because he appeared to be seizing too much power, to be meddling in Congress, to be sort of subverting the executive hierarchy. And as long as people didn't do that, they seemed to actually accept the cabinet. So that really surprised me. The Senate was very wary of having its power taken from it. Um, and then when that happened, they were um, definitely sort of resentful and um, aware that that process was happening. But a lot of the Federalists in the Senate worked very closely with Hamilton and Knox, and there wasn't a very good, um, state secrets weren't really a thing that they did a very good job keeping quiet. So Hamilton was constantly like funneling information to the Federalists, and Jefferson was constantly funneling information to Madison and the Jeffersonian Republicans. So they kind of developed these factions in Congress to represent the different wings that they saw in the cabinet. Great. Um, our next question comes from Charlie Clark. Did the first cabinet agencies have their own offices in New York and Philadelphia? Um, excellent question. So uh, they did. Um, they had, they rented out their own little offices. Sometimes it was either in the same building where they decided to live or if it was a couple blocks away. But if you, there are some amazing records that still exist. There are state um, or city, city directories. So if you look at the Philadelphia city directory from say 1793, it lists their office and it lists their private residence. So um, today that would be horrific because that would be, you know, a real security lapse. But yeah, in the city directories, they lifted, listed where all these people lived um, and where their offices were. And usually they were within a block or two of their home for good reason. But what's amazing is they were actually all in Philadelphia, especially they were in this like eight block radius. So they were all in this nucleus around the president's house. And which makes it even more interesting to think about Hamilton and Jefferson who despised each other and couldn't get away from each other fast enough and were constantly locked in the cabinet and then only lived a few blocks from each other. So they must have just been completely frustrated that they couldn't ever escape the other person. Great. Um, our next question comes from Philip, Philip Melnick. Um, can you discuss the resignation of Attorney General Edmund Randolph? So this is actually one of my favorite sections of the book to write. Um, it is in chapter eight that talks about the J Treaty and some of the, the fallout from that. So what makes this particular incident so challenging to write about is the records that we have are very sparse for cabinet discussions. Um, Randolph left records later, but Washington didn't ever write about what he thought about the subject. And unfortunately, we don't really have any minutes. So a little bit of a backstory, what happened? In 1794, as the Whiskey Rebellion is taking place, at this point, Edmund Randolph has been bumped up to Secretary of State. And he starts exchanging, having conversations with the new French minister, whose name was Fauché. And he basically says to Fauché, or what I think he says to Fauché is, if you were to invest in the rebels, you could change the course of basically United States history. I think that's what he said. Fauché writes a series of letters back to the French government in Paris, these dispatches, and the dispatches the next year are basically um, 
the French ship that's carrying them is captured by a British ship. And the British ship hands them over to the British minister in the United States, who hands them over to the Federalists in the cabinet. And that was Oliver Wolcott Jr. and Timothy Pickering. And they didn't particularly like Randolph because he was more of a Jeffersonian Republican. And he also was Washington's favorite at this point. He had a very close relationship with Washington and Washington preferred to meet with him one-on-one. -on -one. So I think that they were kind of out to get him personally. Um, these dispatches were in French, they translated them. The, the sentence in particular that they translated implied that Randolph basically said if Fauché gave him a bribe, he would change the course of events. But you can see how the way I first introduced it and then the bribe sentence, they're very similar. It's just a matter of where you put that emphasis. So they get a hold of these letters, they give them to Washington. Washington doesn't read French, he doesn't speak French. So he's relying on Wolcott and Pickering's interpretation, which I don't think is a very good one. And he gets these letters, he meets with Wolcott and Pickering, and then he brings, he has Randolph come and meet with them and they basically confront him. And Randolph is so insulted that Washington wouldn't talk to him one-on-one, -on -one, wouldn't present this in a different way and would allow Wolcott and Pickering to question him. He's, he's such an affront to his honor, but also an affront to their decades long personal relationship. Randolph had been Washington's private lawyer before he became the attorney general. He was so affronted and so upset that he resigned immediately and locked his office and left and then realized, hey, I might wanna actually defend myself from these charges of treason and bribery and asked for a series of letters to basically prove his innocence. Whether those letters got displaced in the mail or delayed or Pickering didn't really send them right away is kind of hard to tell, but Randolph concludes that Washington is basically stalling and he publishes everything in the press. And there is absolutely no way to destroy a relationship with Washington faster than publicizing private correspondence in the press. And so they never speak again. Um, what Randolph eventually writes the vindication of Edmund Randolph, and he goes on to actually have a very long um, private attorney career in uh, Virginia. So he does okay, but he never again becomes the public figure that he was. Great. A really colorful chapter. <laughs> it's a very colorful chapter because it's also like you can, you can feel the anguish coming from both of them that they wish that it had gone differently. They miss the relationship and they don't know how to fix it because they were so important to the other person. So it's definitely one of the more personal chapters. And like I said, it was one of my favorite to write. Our next question comes from Kelly Costello. Um, did writing this book impart any big lessons or collaboration tips that you've incorporated into your life? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so I would say for me, the biggest thing that I took away is I started to pay attention to cabinets um, more broadly in American history. And I became convinced that they are the best and most important way to understanding any presidency and any administration because managing a cabinet is a nearly impossible task. It is so hard for one person to hold together all of these different personalities and their ambitions and goals and egos and um, agendas. And so if a president can do that well, then that is a remarkable skill. And when cabinets are going well, we actually tend not to notice them. Their successes appear to be presidential successes. When cabinets are going badly, when there's scandal and turnover and bad things, then they become very noticeable. So I've become convinced that cabinets deserve way more attention than they, um, than they get. But then from a leadership perspective, I knew this already, but I was struck over and over and over again by Washington's willingness to show up and say, I don't know what to do. What do you think I should do? And take all of the opinions, listen to them, contemplate, and then make a reasoned and well-informed decision. And it takes a lot of courage and personal strength to admit when you don't know something and to go about making decisions in that way. And I was blown away by that again and again and again. Great. Um, so our next two questions um, are kind of about who's not included in the cabinet. Um, 
So Deborah Roberts asked, did Washington's lifeguard, her, his bodyguard, report to the military through the chain of command or was he um, a cabinet or through someone in the cabinet? So the lifeguard was um, a military function that occurred during the, the Revolutionary War. And it was a part of the Continental Army apparatus and was built out once it was discovered that there were actually these plots against Washington's life. And so they started to build out a security force for the commander in chief, but also to ensure that like, you know, the important papers were safely transported from place A to place B. So very important sort of like intelligence security matters um, in addition to sort of a secret service, if you will, for Washington. What's remarkable about when Washington is the president, he has no guards. He has an enslaved manservant who goes almost everywhere with him, and that was Christopher Shields for most of the presidency. Um, and he usually has footmen as well on his, you know, on the carriage. And when he goes out riding, he often has people accompany him. Um, but he doesn't have secret service. He doesn't have any sort of guard. And in fact, that doesn't come until after Abraham Lincoln is assassinated, which kind of blows my mind that there were all of these presidents that just kind of went about their business <laughs> and they were fine. That is really shocking to modern. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and also the, there was no security at the White House the, for um, until after the Civil War. The White House was just open during the day and you could come and sit and hope you could get an appointment and people would come in and out and often like snip the corner of a curtain to try and take a souvenir. And it was, you know, it's kind of mind boggling for us to think about today, but there was a lot of access to the president. Um, so our next question comes from Craig Howell, who asks, um, was the Postmaster General part of Washington's cabinet, or um, did that come later? Yes, the Postmaster General was not part of Washington's cabinet. That came later, and then, of course, was removed again from the cabinet, I think, in the 1970s. It was made an in 1970s, 1990s. It was made an independent organization separate from the executive departments. I believe it came into the cabinet, maybe in Jefferson's presidency. It's either in Jefferson, I think, or maybe Madison. Um, but so yes, Washington did have a postmaster general, but was not a part of the cabinet. Great. Um, our next question comes from um, Margot McKinley, or McGinley. Um, in writing the book, did it give you a different perspective or opinion on our current government and its state? Um, yes. So one of the things that I found to be so remarkable was if we look at Article 2 of the Constitution, which is the one that creates the presidency, it's really, really short. And there are so many details, day-to-day -day details about how the president is supposed to govern, how it's supposed to interact with citizens, other branches of government, all of that that had to be fleshed out by Washington and the first office holders. As a result, so much of those things are norms and customs, and they become something that we expect and we hold dear because people have repeated them time and time again, not because they're written down or they're enshrined in legislation or statute. And, and that is still true today. It is remarkable how much of the presidency is built totally on expectation, and there's very little holding that in place. And if someone doesn't want to comport with that expectation, and isn't held in place by sort of the traditional standards of public shaming or, execu or not executions, <laughs> elections, um, that makes a lot more sense, then they can get away with a lot of stuff that we don't traditionally hold to be normal political behavior. So the more that I study the presidency and the more that I study the cabinet, the more I see how much really was built out by the first couple of administrations and then has held true for most of our history. And we had two folks submit questions about John Adams. Was he ever included in the cabinet meetings? What was his role? Poor John Adams. Um, so I have such a, as you can tell, I have such a soft spot in my heart for the Adams family, um, both Adamses, President, President's Adams. Um, so John Adams, early on, Washington asked him for some written advice on especially sort of social etiquette and how the president should comport himself. In the summer of 1789, Congress debated what they should call the president. 
And John Adams wanted a very lengthy and regal sounding title that was, I think, something like his excellency and protector of our liberties and justice or something like that. I mean, it's really quite a mouthful. And um, he earned a bad reputation for it. It squandered a lot of his political capital. And a lot of the senators started calling him his rotundity or the royal vice um, behind his back or not, as the case may be. Adams and Washington certainly respected each other, but I don't know that they were ever particularly close and their personalities didn't necessarily mesh in a great way. And when this all happened, I think Washington kind of became convinced that maybe John Adams' political judgment wasn't always spot on. Later on in his presidency, Washington did ask for his input a couple of times via writing, but he was never invited to the cabinet, which I think is pretty remarkable. Great. Um, so I'll take the privilege of asking the next question. How did Washington get around the fact that Congress wanted things in writing? Um, <laughs> did that ever come up? Was, that, was there ever fallout? No. That's the remark that that is one of the truly remarkable things about this process is that there doesn't ever seem to have been any pushback. There was certainly moments where Congress asked for the papers or written correspondence about a particular issue if they you know formed an investigative committee and Washington did comply with the first several of those requests and turned over the papers. But no, there was, and you know, they would occasionally ask, like they asked Jefferson to come speak to a committee about a particular issue, but there didn't ever seem to be any pushback. Okay. Blows my mind. Very strange, but all right. <laughs> um, okay, well, we're almost out of time. So we are gonna end with a question about education. Um, Scott Neal asks, do you have any suggestion for history students today? Oh, that's a big question. Um, so I would say that uh, history does not have to be, you know, facts and timelines or maps that we traditionally see in a textbook. So for a student who's maybe interested, find a subject that you are, that you like, that you're passionate about. It can be cars, it can be cooking, it can be video games, it can be technology and start digging into that and see where that leads you. And my guess is you could probably find podcasts, you could probably find cool videos, you can probably find interesting photographs about those subjects. There is a way to get anyone interested in history if you start with what they like first. Um, and that is my favorite way to start a historic conversation with someone is figure out what their passion is and go from 